Arafosa Blondi, also known commonly as the Goliath Bird Eater, was originally described by Pierre-André Latrell in 1804. There are two other closely related species to the Blondi, and they are the Therophosa apophysis, the Pinkfoot Goliath, and the Therophosa sturmi, the Burgundy Goliath bird eater. This is a very large New World terrestrial tarantula that comes from Brazil, Guyana, and Venezuela. Of these three species of Therophosa, the Blondie is the most moisture dependent, more so as an adult than as a spiderling. This Goliath bird eater is also one of the few tarantulas that can make an audible noise as they can hiss when they feel threatened. They produce this sound through stridulation, which is when they rub their legs together that have specialized hairs, creating a hissing sound. The T. Blondi is widely said to be the largest spider in the world, when in fact that title probably belongs to the Heteropoda maxima, or the giant huntsman spider, if you're going to go by the leg span. There is also the Pamphibetus antennos and the Lasiodora periabana that could also give the T. Blondi a run for its money as far as being the largest tarantula. But there is no doubt that this is a large, thick, and heavy tarantula that is an intimidating sight in person. Females of this species can reach a leg span of 10 to 11 inches, with some people claiming that theirs have grown as much as 12 inches. Usually their leg span is about the size of a dinner plate. Now males are a little bit smaller with a leg span around 9 inches or so. While males typically only live about 5 to 6 years, females can live for well over 20 years. This genus is also known for having extremely irritating urticating hairs that can lead to itching, burning, rashes, and even blisters if you were to come in contact with them. The side effects can be even worse if you were to get the hairs in your nose, mouth, or eyes. The venom for this species is not considered medically significant, but due to the size of the tarantula and its thick fangs, a bite would be quite painful regardless of its weak venom. Though they look somewhat similar, there are some differences between the Blondie, Sturmy, and the Apophysis. The Blondie has setae on the patella and the bottom side of the femora, while the Sturmy does not, and the Apophysis has much more setae, which can be most obviously seen on the bottom side of the legs. Also, the Blondie has fangs and chelicerae that are smaller than the Sturmy, and its carapace is also a little flatter. While the mature males of both the Sturmy and Blondie lack tibial hooks, the Apophysis mature males do have tibial hooks. The Apophysis is also set apart by having more of a pinkish color hue, and the spiderlings of this species are distinctly different as they have pinkish bands at the end of their legs. They also have lighter colored palps, where the Sturmy and Blondie spiderlings have much darker palps. These tarantulas are opportunistic burrowers, especially as spiderlings and juveniles, which means you need to provide them with a hide and plenty of substrate for them to dig in. I keep my spiderlings in a large acrylic terrestrial spiderling enclosure that is wider than my other spiderling enclosures. As the spiderlings of this species can be larger than most other species, and the fact that they put on a lot of size in between molts, their spiderling enclosures are nearly the size of what I use as a normal juvenile enclosure. This tea is also very fast as slings and prone to quickly bolt and erratically run around the enclosure when disturbed. So I am sure to give them an enclosure that provides enough room to move around so they don't dash out of their enclosure anytime I open the lid. I keep these species on cocoa fiber with vermiculate and sphagnum moss mixed in to help with drainage and to maintain humidity. I pour water down the corners of the enclosure to soak the bottom layer of substrate and let it start to dry out before re-soaking, while always keeping the water dish full. I also place some sphagnum moss in the enclosure that I wet about once a week to help maintain a higher humidity level. In the enclosure I use for this species, I opt for cross ventilation holes as opposed to ventilation on top of the enclosure. This aids in keeping a little more humidity in while providing beneficial cross ventilation. 
Once this tea molts and begins to enter a juvenile stage, I move them into a bioactive juvenile enclosure. For this type of enclosure, I take a display case for something like a football and put ventilation holes on two sides of the enclosure. I put a small layer of clay balls or pea gravel on the bottom. I then add a layer of mesh and top it off with a bioactive substrate that you can purchase from businesses like Josh's Frogs or BioDude. If I don't have any of that readily available, I use a 50-50 mixture of cocoa fiber and peat moss and then add in some vermiculate and sphagnum moss. I wet the entire substrate until water begins to drain down to the bottom layer. I provide a hide and large water dish and add a few plants that don't require extremely bright light. Having plants really makes the enclosure look nice, but also contributes to the humidity of the enclosure. I add springtails and sometimes some blue dwarf isopods to help keep the enclosure clean. This tea is still very bolty at this size. So when it looks like it's starting to outgrow this enclosure, I move it into a larger acrylic enclosure set up nearly identical. This type of enclosure I also make myself from clear acrylic shoe boxes for boots that I have on the enclosure and husbandry list in my Amazon store, which is linked below in the description of this video. I put cross ventilation holes on the sides of the enclosure and start with a layer of clay balls, then mesh, and then the same substrate as the previous enclosure. I will also add plants, a large water dish, and a nice hide. The larger this species gets, especially the tea blondie, the more diligent I am to make sure to not let the enclosure dry out and to keep the humidity level up. Once this tarantula really starts to put on size, I set up its final adult enclosure. A lot of people use 15 to 20 gallon glass aquariums, but personally I am using the Exoterra medium low enclosure with some modifications. This tarantula can climb the glass walls of the enclosure despite its size and can be quite strong and will easily push off any lid that isn't securely locked down. It also has very large and powerful fangs that can chew through nearly any mesh lid. I prefer the Exoterra because it provides some cross ventilation in its design with an opening in the front below the doors as well as having a locking lid at four points. The mesh screen of this enclosure is not ideal and must be removed and replaced with acrylic sheets securely siliconed into place. I start again with a drainage layer of clay balls or small gravel, followed by a layer of mesh, then add the bioactive substrate from before. I provide a large water dish, a large hide, and plenty of substrate for the tea to burrow in. Though at this size, they tend to spend a lot of time out in the open. I add some springtails to keep things clean and healthy and add a few plants. I also put plenty of sphagnum moss in a few different places in the enclosure and wet them down once a week or so to help keep the humidity up. As far as feeding, I feed my spiderling one to two small crickets twice a week and remove any uneaten prey within 24 hours. I await about four or five days after a molt before attempting to feed again. It is important to give the freshly molted tarantula enough time to harden up after a molt. For juveniles, I feed three to four medium crickets every seven to 10 days, depending on the size of the abdomen. I will feed more often for a while after a molt, but as the abdomen begins to get larger, I cut back to every two to three weeks until the tea enters pre-molt. And once they are adults, I feed them three to four large dubia roaches every other week, or about a dozen crickets every two to three weeks. I also mix up their diet with large superworms, green worms, red runners, or any other large invertebrate feeder that I have available. Despite their name, the tarantula does not actually eat birds, and even feeding them a live mouse can be dangerous if the mouse were to bite the tarantula during the struggle. There are plenty of videos online of people feeding the Goliath bird eaters live mice, and they get a lot of views and are very dramatic to watch. But personally, I don't want to risk the health of my specimens and risk a live mouse biting off a leg or even worse, rupturing the tea's abdomen in the struggle. 
I don't want to risk my tarantula's health and well-being for the sake of making an exciting video. A possible alternative would be to feed your Theraphosa adult a feeder lizard like an anole once or twice a year. It is very important that whatever you choose to feed your Goliath bird eater, you clean up after them. You need to remove any uneaten prey, boluses, or molts as soon as possible, as the humidity in their enclosure is higher than most other enclosures, and these things can quickly mold and attract unwanted guests like mites or even ants. So spot cleaning is important, especially after feeding. Taking into consideration the size and weight of this tarantula, its very irritating urticating hairs, its nervous nature and propensity to bolt, not to even mention the size of its fangs. I would not recommend trying to hold this tarantula. If for no other reason than accidentally dropping a tarantula of this size from almost any real height could prove to be fatal if its abdomen were to rupture in the fall. When I'm cleaning this tea's enclosure, rehousing, or any time I come into close contact with it, I make sure to wear thick nitrile gloves, long sleeves, and even eye protection, because I want to avoid being exposed to the urticating hairs whenever possible. Now due to the size, speed, and humidity requirements for this tarantula, it's not one I would suggest as a beginner tea. In fact, I would say it's more of a moderate to more experienced level of tarantula. So once you've been keeping teas for a while and you've built up your confidence and your experience, had some other large tarantulas or tarantulas that are a little more bolty and rehouse some fast ones, and maybe even had a species or two that's a little more moisture dependent, then I would begin considering adding one of these to your collection. Now having said that, I'm sure there are a a lot of people out there that got this as one of their first few tarantulas. So I'm not saying you can't have one or that you won't be able to care for it properly. I'm just suggesting that if you don't have one, then you just work up to it. It is a staple in the hobby and eventually a must have in anyone's collection. This is a very large tarantula, very gorgeous and very sought after. And sometimes there's not a lot of them available and you just need to pick up a spiderling when you have the chance. Now, currently I have two blondies, a Sturmy and an Apophysis, and I keep them all essentially the same. So this video kind of covers all three of those species, kind of three birds with one stone. Now an interesting fact about this species is a local tribe called the Yanomamo considers this tarantula a delicacy and they've been seen actually capturing, roasting, and eating the tarantula. So not everyone keeps them as pets. You know, I waited a while before adding any of these species to my collection because I wanted to be a lot more confident in my abilities as a keeper and I was kind of turned off by the humidity requirements needed for this species. But after having some bioactive enclosures that worked out really well, I figured I was ready to add this species to my collection. I was also under the impression that this was just another big brown tarantula and I wasn't too excited to shell out the money for it. I was more interested in getting OBTs and GBBs and brightly colored tarantulas. But now having had a few for a little while, I can say that they are amazing and definitely more than just another brown tarantula. Most of mine are still spiderlings or juveniles, but even at that stage of life, they're still really cool to watch. And the t stormy I just added to my collection within the past week. One of the members from the Facebook group was trying to get rid of some of their tea, so I picked one up from her. So I'm very excited about that one. I'm also excited because this channel is about to cross 4,000 subscribers, and we've got a little giveaway contest. If you haven't seen that video, it's the last video I uploaded, so check that out if you want to enter. Now, if you want to stay in touch with me between videos, just check out my website, thetarantulacollective.com. From there, you can find all the different social media accounts I have, whether it's the Facebook group, subreddit, Twitter, Instagram, or Patreon. Whatever social media you're on, I would enjoy interacting with you. This was another species that a lot of people requested, so I'm glad I was able to cover that for all of you that were asking me to do this. And if you got a species you would like to see me cover in future episodes of Tarantula Tuesday, be sure to leave that comment down below, and I will definitely add it to the list and get to it as soon as possible. If you got any questions or you just want to talk, leave that comment down there too. I try to answer every single one of them. Now, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure you hit that like button. It means a lot to me, and it helps future keepers find these videos further on down the line. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel so you'll stay up to date on any videos I upload in the future. Feel free to share this video with your friends or other hobbyists. Help me get the word out. And if you're interested about anything that I use in my bioactive enclosures or in my tarantula collection in general, just look in the description down below. Just click that little arrow button in the bottom right hand corner if you're watching this on your cell phone. And that'll drop down the description and you'll see a link for the Amazon store. I've got different lists, ones for like care and husbandry, ones for tarantula clothes, 
tarantula books, even the camera equipment I use to make these videos. And anything you purchase off these lists from Amazon, a small percentage of that does come back and help support the channel. But thank you all for watching. I do appreciate all the love and support you guys are sending my way. But this was a lot of fun and an exciting species to cover, but that's gonna wrap it up for me this week. I will see you next Tuesday.